Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Chase Stanton, and I'm the station manager for Saline Community Television Network. And today, in a partnership with the Saline Post and the Saline Reporter, we're welcoming you to the City Council Candidate Forum. Uh, to my left here, I have Austin Smith, who is going to be one of the moderators, along with Fran Long Longmore, uh, in our City Council Candidate position. In the City Council Candidate positions, we have Dean Gearbaugh, we have Sal Randazzo, we have David Rhodes, and we have Janet Dillon. Uh, so I'm gonna hand it over to Austin, and just a quick reminder, there are cue cards back in the back here if you want to write down questions for the candidates. We're gonna be starting with questions from Fran and Austin, but then we'll be moving into uh, questions from all of you. So, Austin. Welcome everybody, and thanks so much for coming. Uh, I wanna thank our panelists and our organizers um, for, um, putting this all together and I want to thank Ch uh, Chase and Tran especially for uh, letting the new guy in town would too close yeah sorry let me repeat let me start over welcome everybody and thanks for coming <laughs> I want to thank our panelists and our organizers and especially I want to thank uh, Chase and Tran for letting the new guy in town take part in such a wonderful community event this I'm, I'm going to go over the rules um, for the benefit of the audience and, and the panelists. Uh, this will be a round robin style question and response uh, forum in which each of you will be asked, uh, presented the same question. Uh, you will have an opportunity before we get started to introduce yourselves and uh, the introductions will be limited to two minutes, 30 seconds. Um, the two minutes, 30 seconds will also be uh, your time for the, que for the moderator questions. Uh, audience submitted responses, in other words, uh, audience submitted uh, questions that come to us, uh, those responses will be limited to 90 seconds. Uh, and your closing statements will also be limited to 90 seconds. I'm sorry if that's a little convoluted, please ask me before I sit down if you have questions on any of those time constraints. Uh, time will be moderated using uh, cards. Uh, a red, car yellow card means you have 15 seconds to wrap up your answer. Red card means you have zero seconds and you should stop. Uh, the moderators, Tran and myself, will ask a series of, excuse me, five questions, and then we will turn it over, then we will go to the audience portion of the questions. We ask that all comments from the panelists and submitted questions from the audience uh, be focused on local, uh, the, uh, local issues impacting the Saline community. In other words, try uh, uh, to avoid uh, making personal individual comments. Or, and we reserve the right uh, as panelists uh, to reject any uh, submitted questions from the audience that we feel are inappropriate. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, do you have any questions about the time? Any questions at all? Wonderful. Trent, I believe we're starting with Dean. Starting with Dean. I can start. Okay. Here we go, first question. We are going to go right down the line. Uh, I'm sorry, we get uh, introductions go first. Okay. Good Do evening all, and thank you for uh, moving on this first committee. It's an opportunity to speak to everyone. We haven't had a chance to actually Again, I'd like to thank everyone for coming tonight that's presenting us and here to watch us and listen to us speak. Um, my name is Dean Gearbach. I'm a lifelong citizen of Saline. My um, background is in financial and administrative management. I've worked for the University of Michigan. I have over 28 years of experience wor working with the university. And my background is also in accounting, uh, other activities including human, per human resources, personnel, student administration, resource allocation. That's all my um, professional background. I've been on city council for two different sessions. I was in um, 1997 to 2003, and then also um, now since 2010, almost a total of 10 years. I've served on multiple planning commissions, um, other commissions for the school. My background is also uh, in family business. We own a property that has been in our family for over 90 years in downtown Saline, and that's been part of my reason to continue on council as it's been part of a tradition of my family. My grandfather and my great-great-grandfather were on city council 
and it's one of the things that i think is one of the reasons for being a great community is that we have the tradition of family and we have the tradition of individuals that have committed to themselves to be a part of our community which i continue to do is so my hope tonight is to give you a little better idea of who i am and i know a lot of people already know that i've worked for the city of saline for a number of years had a very passionate approach to different items including our street our streets um, social issues and other items that i think are very important to which i believe that the city is moving forward and developing as it should and we need to look at how we continue as a community to develop connections to develop economic needs to develop and maintain our citizens affordability to keep taxes appropriate to keep services available and to keep our town safe secure and clean for those individuals that live here thank you thank you uh, good evening i'm sal randazzo and i'm a resident of city saline for 28 years i raised five wonderful children in this community i still have one at home who's uh, 17. Uh, it's been a wonderful uh, time in saline but it's been over a uh, a period of 28 years um, watching uh, the community change not only in the population but also in the governance and uh, what I bring to the table I'm not a politician I'm just a regular guy and I'm very very nervous uh, being up here but um, I think uh, uh, I'd like to characterize what I'm doing is not really running for office but just seeking office and very reluctantly because I, I feel like we're at a crossroads here in, in Saline uh, with the type of governance that we have. And uh, I say that from experience of dealing with the government. I was in uh, on the Parks Commission for one year. And uh, just quickly in my experience of uh, coming on to the commission, I, I read the city charter and I recognized that the Parks Commission was supposed to have a set of bylaws of which govern them. And when I received all the documents uh, prior to starting my, my term on the uh, Parks Commission, I never got a copy of the bylaws. And so when I asked for them, nobody had seen them in years. So the uh, Parks Commission was just very running by the seat of their pants and, and being directed by the staff. Uh, it took several months, but they did find an old copy of the uh, of the bylaws. And I read those and I thought, wow, these are really good bylaws. They govern this body, they tell it exactly what it's supposed to do. And so at uh, the, the soonest, earliest meeting that I attended, I made a motion that since we found the bylaws that we all go ahead and start to abide by the bylaws. And I couldn't even get a second of, on, that emo, uh, on that motion. You have to understand that the people on the commission did not want to run the commission by the written rules, which is, just very wrong to me. We live in a society of rules, and rules are meant to um, uh, govern the people who govern. And if you don't have those rules, then there's just all kinds of calamity uh, that would happen. So I want to focus on bringing the government back to the rule of law. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Thanks for taking time from your schedules to come out and listen to us talk. Uh, I'm David Rhodes, and I am married to Leslie Needhammer, who is a lovely lady out here in the audience also, and she is the director of the Saline uh, District Library. I've been on city council for eight years now, been ele elected four times. This is my fifth term that I'm running for. Um, I'm pretty active in the community, as, as many of you know. Um, I am also the city council liaison to the environmental commission, and we have an environmental commission member here in the audience. Um, two, two actually, I'm sorry, Mary. Um, it's a very active group. I've done a lot. I've um, handled the e-waste events that uh, many of you have participated in, and I appreciate that. Uh, I'm also active in uh, on Saline Main Street. I'm a member of two of their teams. One is the business and economic success team, and the other is the design team. And both of those teams, as well as other people on Main Street, the city and the Chamber of Commerce, are beginning to work on figuring out what the design should be for Michigan Avenue when it gets reconstructed in the year 2016. 
and I am sure that there will be opportunity for all of you in the audience and others to make comments about uh, about what you think Michigan Avenue should look like. Uh, <coughs> I'm, I'm pretty passionate about Saline. I've, I've lived here for 15 years now, um, and I live on South Ann Arbor Street, and I, I really feel like I'm part of Saline. I, well, there, there's been talk over the years about old Saline and new Saline. Well, when I moved here, I didn't perceive that at all. It was a very welcoming committee. Um, I, I worked with folks um, from all the spectrum of uh, economic strata and from ages and genders. Um, I'm active in the uh, Saline Area Senior Center, uh, Historic Society. I was uh, president of that for two years. I'm currently chair of the Coalition for a Quality Community. So I'm, I'm busy in the community, but I love it. It's what I want to do. And I hope you all will reelect me for another term. Thank you. Thanks, Debbie. Hi, I'm Janet Dillon, and I am running for city council because I'm proud to call Celine my home. Janet Dillon, and I'm running for city council. I'm proud to call Celine my home. And unlike the others up here, I'm relatively new to Celine. I've only been here for eight years, but my family chose Celine. We based our decision to move here solely on its reputation. And we're happy. We want to stay here long term. And it's that reason that I want to be involved in our city's government and make sure that Celine stays where it's at and continues to grow and move forward and become more prosperous in the future. I'm very nervous, so bear with me, please. <laughs> I'm active in the community. My family and I participate in a lot of activities. We make an effort to be involved in city and events know about city politics and the general goings on in the city. And because of that, I feel as though I am in touch with what's going on in Saline. I know some of its strengths and some of the weaknesses. And I think I could be effective in the future of Saline and moving things forward. I'll listen to what, this, what the community wants and more over what it doesn't want. Um, city Council is not just here to rubber stamp a plan. We need the involvement of the community and we need someone to represent their point of view. And that's what I want to be. And I'll work hard for Celine. My experience is vast in numerous ways. I volunteer a lot in the Saline community and I have a lot of understanding because of that. Um, I've been very successful in leadership roles, but I've also been part of teams and been successful with that too. And I understand about compromising and compromising doesn't mean that somebody has to win and somebody has to lose. It's not necessarily a black and white issue. There's a lot of variation. Janet. Yeah. Sorry, I Sorry. feel bad cutting you off. Yeah. Thank you everybody for your introductions. We're gonna go ahead and get started with the questions. Um, I apologize, one thing I did not mention um, in my comments before is if you have a specific rebuttal to a comment made uh, to somebody previously, Let me try just turning it off.
Well, I would support lowering taxes. Uh, taxes have doubled in uh, the last 10 years. That's been well documented. Uh, government is, seems to have a problem that, that we don't use in our own lives. If, if our wages are lowered or we have to take another job at a lower wage, we learn to live within that wage. The argument recently uh, with uh, not only city government, but county government and, and so on, is that because there's less property values and there's less money coming into the municipalities and the, and the coffers of the government, that we need to charge the people more. I mean, that just doesn't make sense. When uh, people are suffering because their property values are lower, uh, wages are not going up uh, proportionally with the cost of living, the wrong thing to do is to have city government come after those people and take more of their money. So I would be absolutely against raising taxes. I'm all for cutting. Uh, I mean, recently, City of Saline just bought another piece of property for $66,000. They own more property in the city than I think uh, Farisha does. And they keep buying more using taxpayer money to buy it. It's, uh, it's kind of ridiculous to go on buying sprees with taxpayer money. David, same question. Um, you know, I, I support the concept of lower taxes, but I also recognize the need to maintain Uh, just talk louder because yeah, the mic is just going out, right? Okay, so anyway, I, I support the concept of having lower taxes, but I also realize that we need to maintain our community in the, in the manner that is welcoming to people and so we have good roads. Um, our DPW, Department, Department of Public Works, I believe is excellent. They do great work. We have a city staff that is very dedicated to our community. They uh, went through a number of years of having salary freezes, um, increased expenditures out of their pockets for health care and other things, but there is a limit as to what you can do to your staff and still expect them to work well for you. We have to maintain the morale of those folks. We need good people in the city, otherwise we won't have the community that we have now and that we've come to enjoy. We, uh, we enjoy the, uh, the pleasures of our various parks and other uh, attributes within the community. Those things take money to, uh, to maintain. And, and it's not all as simple as what it may seem to someone who's on the outside looking at, at, the, at the process. We have um, a fairly, I don't even wanna say a fairly large, we have an adequate number of city staff um, in order to, to maintain things, but what we don't have are the resources to improve what we, uh, what we would like to see in some areas. So I favor lower taxes, but I think the only way we're gonna do that is to increase the tax base. And so I work really hard at trying to get more businesses to come to the city of Saline to take up shop within our community. Um, that's, that's a way to lower uh, lower our tax bill, or at least not increase it while we're still trying to maintain our infrastructure. Truthfully, no one wants to pay higher taxes. No one wants <coughs> to spend more money than they have to. But what we need to look at is at what cost is lowering our taxes? Are we gonna lose services? Is the quality of services gonna go down? Are we going to have fewer amenities? And are we gonna have a less than standard quality of life in our city that we're used to? I miss certain things that have been cut from the city due to the budget. And I would be willing to have them brought back if it were just a small tax increase. Maybe I stand alone in that, but I think there are other people and don't misunderstand that I'm not in favor of a tax increase, but we need to do what we have to do to maintain our city. And the easiest way to maintain it is to develop our businesses and our housing market. If we can do that, we can spread the burden around and take some of that away from the taxpayers. Um, a 
course, everyone wants to maintain their tax as a rule of we've attempted in the city to try I and hear address. You. We've attempted in the city to try and address this matter by looking at costs and expenses. A number of areas have been addressed and have been reduced. They've reduced staffing. They've addressed other activities. We even tried in the last two years to look at reducing and trying to outsource our dispatch. But the members and individuals of Saline did not want that to occur. As a result of that, if we're going to provide services, we have to have revenue to support those. As a result, of almost $100,000 a year savings could have occurred, or more so, had we gone with that. But as a result, we didn't. So we had to maintain taxes. We also faced such an unusual hit from the recession that if we had not raised our taxes, we would have cut services. We would have either had to eliminate rec programs, eliminate police officers, eliminate staff, eliminate services, not do roads. There were a number of items that would have had to stop as a result of no revenue coming in. Initially, I recall when I was first on council, we were attempting to try and count on land sales to assess with that because we were selling a lot of, a lot of land. That's not happening now. We still have industrial parks, thankfully, that are generating revenue for us. But unfortunately, until the economy picks up and the recession comes around, we can't guarantee that we're not going to have to look at our tax base and address how our rates are charged. We slightly increased it last year because we did not know what the state was going to do in terms of personal property tax. They attempted to potentially take 20% out of our revenue, and we would have been so hit by that that we did not know what we were going to do, and we wanted to prevent that from happening as a result of any of this kind of impact that could have occurred. In addition, we lost over $300,000 of state revenue in the last 10 years because of our Lansing initiatives that have put more tax cuts towards business and not necessarily towards the homeowners or the individual residents of our state. So we have to understand that the whole philosophy has changed in Lansing, that they're shoving everything down to our level, and if we want to maintain the lifestyle and the community that we have and the safety and everything, we have to step up to the plate. That being said, I agree with Mr. Rhodes that we do have to look at development, redevelopment, and whatever we can do to increase our tax base to help offset the um, hit that's happening on citizens. But at this point, I think we're doing the best that we can, and our staff has done the best that they can, and I'm proud of our city manager and our former council that have worked on this. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. All right, we start question two with David Rose, and this question is about public transportation. Uh, looking both short and long term, does Celine need to expand public transportation? What would that look like, and how would it be funded? Well, first uh, answer to that is yes, Celine does need to expand our, our public transportation. We currently have um, one bus uh, from People's Express, and a second one has just recently been added to handle our out of town runs. But, um, and we are in some very preliminary discussions with AAATA out of Ann Arbor to perhaps uh, contract for services from them so that individuals who would rather take a bus to get to work or get to the hospital up in Ann Arbor would have the ability to do that. The impact of increasing more public transportation will mean less pressure, less demand on our roads for um, single vehicles uh, to travel around as we have now. Uh, I suspect that one of our questions is going to come to us later probably has to do with Michigan Avenue, so I won't say too much about that. But um, I think having more public transportation will, will lessen uh, the pressure that we have to do something bigger with our, with our uh, transportation system. Um, we have the, the general trend is to uh, drive less. Millennials, which are much, much younger folks than me, apparently are not as interested in cars as I was when I was a teenager because I needed to get a license right away. That, that, was a, that was a sign of growing up a little bit. So anyway, millennials aren't driving as much. Um, other people are not putting as many miles on their cars as they used to. Um, we are working towards having more non-motorized paths in the community so that people can walk and or bicycle to places when they're moving within the community. Um, I recently served with a walking and biking coalition to help get the overpass, uh, Ann Arbor Saline Road overpass over I-94 improved to include a bicycle lane and a protected sidewalk so people could cross 94 and not take their life in their hands every time they did it. 
So, yep, I'm in favor of more public transportation. Thank you. Thanks, David. Janet? It's a yes and no response for me. Um, I do agree that the People's Express buses are well used and well liked, and I would consider maintaining those. Bringing in p big public transportation, I don't see a need for it in Saline at this time. I don't see, I know that in the past it was tried and it had very low usage. And for the amount of passengers, it would not justify the pollution and the on the on the roads I don't see an uh, I think that people's schedules right now fluctuate and it people don't work nine to five to where they can fit into a bus schedule and they need that flexibility of having a vehicle or there is the possibility of carpooling but big buses I don't see a need for them in Celine thanks Janet Dean um, yes, I agree that we need some transportation and probably something that we would enhance upon that we currently have. We've already been talking about potentially working with a hub that would occur at Walmart, but it wouldn't be necessarily that we would add an additional large amount of expense. We just would basically maybe advance a little bit more upon what we already currently have. We've already got some support through a federal grant that's providing the additional bus that's working with People's Express right now. And hopefully by using this at this current point, we can get a better idea of who's actually using the bus and where is it going to. I agree with Mr. Rhodes that we have some concerns that are coming up directly with the aging population. And in fact, the idea about millennials, the issue is I have new employees working for me that do not have a car and they are riding the bus because they're living in local. They don't want to live outside and along doing the commute. I think we still have people that want to commute, but in this situation, if we want to invite younger people and we want to continue to have a more um, connected type environment, Ann Arbor is a large draw on our residents. That's where they go to work. Same thing with St. Joe and that so forth. So if we can encourage that to continue to have people living here and encouraging them to stay here, we'll continue to be a vital city. Um, when we look at paying for it, again, like I said that there are grants and federal grants and so forth on it. We know the state of Michigan is going to be supporting a lot of different alternative transportations. Um, the other aspect is I think we could have a small, and that's what how we look at the People's Express, that may go around town to pick up individuals for small items and be able to go shopping, to uh, maybe go deliver mail or so forth, so forth, those kind of items. Those are the necessities that I, of, our, of individuals that either are dis disabled can't walk, have other handicap, or, or, or just, you know, some people just don't need to drive. And we're all becoming more health conscious. We're becoming more environmentally conscious. I think if we can do that, not with a significant tax increase or even an increase in taxes, that we can try and address this issue. We could benefit from it all over. And again, as Mr. Rhodes had said, some of these activities are going to be wanted. We just need to be able to meet the demand of what people want and figure out how to balance it out in our overall budget. Thanks, Dean. So. Okay, so right here is where we're going to see a distinct difference between me and the other candidates that are here. Number one, from all their answers, they appear to be soft on taxes. They wouldn't like to raise taxes, but if the need arises in order to provide services, they would. I'm absolutely emphatically against raising taxes. There's a lot that be, can be cut. Um, as far as um, as I mentioned earlier, they're buying properties. Where are they getting the money for that if, if they're in dire straits? So uh, beware, uh, Washtenaw County. Uh, the county is coming after you for a transportation tax. That, they just raised uh, half a mil without a vote on, uh, to raise money for roads. The city of Saline has more taxes that they can come after that are statutory allowed. And also, there's a tax that they can do with the, uh, the fire department because they're funding that out of the general, general fund, but there's also, they have the ability to tax that. Plus, uh, they also have the CARES millage. So they've got all these ways to come after you to take more money from you. All right, so transportation. No, absolutely no way. Where is the end of what government is supposed to provide for the community? We need back to basic services, safety, roads, uh, parks, cleanliness. Those are the essential services that government is supposed to pr provide. If one of these people up here say, you know what, if we bring a zoo to Celine, that will just be such a boon for everybody. So let's have a, a Celine zoo. It's ridiculous. They have to be limited. 
one second, I want to read a quote here from Thomas Saul, a, um, a, uh, a, a philosopher and an intellectual. You know the old adage about uh, give a man a fish and uh, he'll eat for a day, or, or teach him to fish and he'll eat for a lifetime. Well, that's, that's been replaced with give a man a fish and he will ask for tartar sauce and french fries. Moreover, some politician who wants his vote will declare all these things to be among his basic rights. And that's where we're headed. And that's where I draw the line. All right. Thanks, Al. Thank we're going to go on to question three now. Uh, question three starts with Janet. Um, this is a question that's already been mentioned once. Uh, it's a huge topic for any community. It's Celine. Can't hear anything these days. Question three is going to start with Janet. It's a topic that's already been mentioned once. Uh, it's a huge um, issue for any community, Celine especially, and that's development. Your question is, if elected, how would you work to make the community more inviting for development, whether it be residential or commercial? What kind of development would you like to see and where? Okay. As far as housing development, the only area pretty much left in Saline is on the west side of the city. And to develop that, it needs to have some sort of connectivity to the rest of Saline. And right now you would have to cross Michigan Avenue in order to be on, an, on a sidewalk to come into Saline, or you'd have to drive. I think that the city needs to look at, if they're going to develop there, providing those people with access to the city, meaning developing sidewalks or something so that people can can enter the city and not feel like they're annexed out. Um, as far as business development, I think we need to look beyond the downtown and we also need to look beyond just small business. Um, I believe that bringing in bigger companies, doesn't have to be big box stores, but bigger companies that can weather ups and downs in the economy more so than the small businessman would give some stability to our city and give some longevity to the business community. Thank you, Janet. Dean, same question. Thank you. Um, of course, I've encouraged growth. And where a redevelopment that could occur is in downtown and around downtown. We have a number of open parcels that could be redone. We all know about 147 uh, West Michigan. We've all been pushing for that. We've also been looking at, there's other lots that are for sale. The city is looking at developing, um, and having a developer come in to do the former um, service center property and also the property on Monroe Street, which by chance, because of the price that the city got, will hopefully be able to generate even additional revenue to pay for the additional other park line that we just recently purchased. And that was one of the reasons why I voted for that, because we were using the land that we already currently own so that we could purchase other property to make an even better environment for individuals. People are looking to have, come into Saline to make sure that they have the type of things that we see in a community in which people believe that's part of it, historic and all those things. We'll move upon those as an advantage too. We have a great historic downtown. We have other historic assets, which people see and address that as being an item to which they want to come to. We have our schools. We promote that. We have a whole branding that we're going to be doing to bring in the people to come to Saline, to want to be in Saline, to work in Saline. Um, I also want to see us potentially, we know that we have a 425 agreement with Saline Township. How that will eventually come about, we don't know. Um, that is the potential for development that may happen, but I don't want to see 4,000 homes come in. But we know that we probably will have some growth there and additional growth that we may have on the west side, just on Austin Road in that area. Of course, that property, individuals may want to come forward and have the city contribute towards it. I'm not seeing that. Developers can pay and they can make their profit, but we don't need to maximize their profit based on the taxpayer dollar. In addition, um, I think one of the things we'll have to look at is trying to encourage a mixed use. We've already put over an overlay district for the downtown with encouraging both residential and commercial so that it'll give a benefit for a developer to come in and basically be able to do two things or three things with a property and not necessarily be restricted. So as a result of that, they can't do what they want to do, but we can work towards that and encourage them to do that. In addition, I hope that our industrial parks, we know that we have property available, but we also know that we can look at different types of uses for those. There may be availability to turn them into some other type of research or technical park, and as a result of 
um, land being used up in Ann Arbor and so forth, hopefully Saline will become more, more important and people will want to develop their business here and use a Saline address as much as they want to use an Ann Arbor address. Thanks, Dean. Sal? Well, here we go again, uh, the growth word. Uh, while I was on the Parks Commission, I was privy to the report from the SEMCOG, the South e Southeastern Michigan Council of Governments. The projected growth of Saline over the next 25 years is 5%. If you do the math, it's a quarter percent per year. It adds up to like one family, like five or six people. That is the growth, and the population is getting older. So 28 years I've lived in this community, and they keep talking about growth, growth, growth. We need to do this. We need to do that. Growth, growth, growth. It's just a word. It's a word to get your attention, it's, but it's not happening. It's not projected to happen. The city's holding on to tons of land. It can't give it away. Look it. We're not growing. We need to maintain what we've got. It's not up, us, up to us to decide what kind of businesses come into Saline or what kind of things we want. Uh, you know, that is, uh, that, that's up to the marketplace. That's up to the free market. Businesses will come into Saline when the property is priced right, when the rents are cheap, when the, when the people have the disposable income to buy what they've got to sell. That's when they come into a community. Make Saline a lean, mean machine and people, businesses, and people will move here because it will be in their best interest. All this tinkering and around, it never has worked. It hasn't worked in 28 years. Thank you, sir. David? Uh, before I address the question at hand, I wanted to just clarify one point, and that is that the CARES millage is a school millage and not a city millage. City has nothing at all to do with that. Um, I'm, I'm in favor of um, having more businesses and residences come to town, and I work very hard at that. Um, I, I'm in the construction industry myself, and so I have opportunities to talk with other um, developers, builders, and I've had conversations with uh, three different individuals about the possibility of picking up 147 West Michigan Avenue and starting that development over again. None of those at this point in time are, have come to fruition, but that is not going to stop me from continuing to try. And I think that it will happen at one point in time. Fortunately, the um, SEMCOG forecast for our growth are just a forecast, just a trend line. And with the uh, impending growth of uh, development of the Houghton School property and the proposal that's going to come to us for the Monroe Street property, we will, in the next year and a half, blow that projection out of the water. So we will, in fact, have some growth within our community. That happens to be residential, and we need residential growth. We need students to come to our schools so that we can continue to have these great schools that we have. When I talk with people about what brought them to Saline, the vast majority of them say it's the school system that came, that brought them here. And then after that, it's the general quality of life that they perceive and that they have seen in the community. So I'm, I'm very happy to go out and continue to promote Celine, and I do that on a regular basis. I, studies, many studies have proven that if you don't have a viable downtown, you don't have a community for very long. It begins to wither and go away. And we don't want that. I don't want that. And so I'm going to continue to work hard for development. Thank you. Thanks, David. All right, so that's it for question number three. We start question number four, I believe, with Dean, right? Wait. Yes. Right. Uh, yeah. All right, so question number four is, what do you want to see happen with US-12 in the 2016 uh, construction project? Um, the thing with US-12 that I'd like to see is how we can improve the safety on it and hopefully the flow of traffic through it. I know we've talked about road diet, and people are concerned that that may be something that would hesitate or actually cause more of a roadblock. Part of my desire now, though, is to address not only Michigan Avenue through our town, but also outside of our town. We need to gather the information now that we can use to show that we can't handle any more traffic coming through downtown through the four corners. We need to sit, get on the case of the county to look at other alternatives. There's potential out there. It's whether or not we have enough influence on doing that. 
Um, as we look towards a more complete streets, which is now a new legislative approach that the state of Michigan wants, they want to see you know, walkability, they want to see bike paths and all those type of things. We either try to put those all in with a five lane road, removing all of the lawn extensions and everything, or we get real and try and look at how can we improve things by using synchronized um, lights, other ways of looking at approaches, better traffic flow, um, trying to address the way traffic comes through by using uh, more reliable speed limits. The idea that we're going from 45, minutes, 45 miles an hour down to 35 miles an hour and then it's picking up again going 40 miles, this is just confusion and craziness by the state and not allowing us to look at how we can actually lay out and control traffic through town so that Michigan Avenue comes out better. There's also the ability for us to try and connect the west side of the city to the center of town. We have some sidewalks, but it's not a great approach. Individuals want to be able to come from our communities, and if we grow to the west, we need to be able to connect west, middle, and the east sides together. The other approach with 12 is I believe that um, if we can put in more safety measures such as crosswalks and the things that we've talked about, different signals, maybe even some small boulevard aspect or whatever that gives you an idea that you have a uh, land or an island of safety in some locations as people come across the street, it may help. I know there's a lot of talk about different changes in traffic and what traffic could be in the future. We just don't know. But at this point, if we don't look at everything from a perspective of even the road diet to even a five-lane road, we don't know what we have and we can't tell individuals what we want and not give a full picture to the population. They're the ones that are going to want to make the decision on us, but we have to have the data and the information in order to do it. So I think that's what I want to see happen with US 12. Thanks, Dean. Sal? I want to uh, take a little time to rebut um, uh, Mr. Rhodes' statement here about the CARES millage. CARES millage, uh, to be honest, is not just for schools. It's for seniors, it's for arts, it's for recreation. It, it covers more. Are you on the CARES board? No. You're not. But uh, Henny Field is a good example. That is a park off of uh, East Bennett Street. About a million dollars went towards the right revitalization, so-called revitalization of that park. A substantial amount came from the CARES millage. The, the Henny Field was supposed to become Celine's Central Park. And to the tune of a million dollars, is there anybody, honestly, that can say that Henny Field is a Central Park? The original designs included an amphitheater and a, uh, a paved area, which could be a uh, skating rink in the winter. But it's not become that at all. It was a million dollars spent so that you could have two baseball diamonds and a path around it and some parking. So the money's not been spent wisely. We don't have a central park. We are trying to uh, build up a downtown that has US 12 going through the middle of it. This is not Chelsea. This is not Dexter. This is not Manchester. We've got US 12 coming right through the middle of our city. And you know what? The people know it. And they've lived here for decades and they understand it and the idea like the fear mongering if we don't do something people are going to move away that's just ridiculous people live in Celine because it's a safe community it's adjacent to many uh, uh, interest and close to an airport and sure the schools factor in but even the schools have gone down their schools of choice and the population was just announced the other day and I think it was about four hundred dollars four hundred people uh, students less than the year before. So we're shrinking, we're not growing, and the idea to keep taxing people at a higher rate is just ridiculous. All right, thanks, Sal. David? Um, Michigan Avenue, US 12, I prefer to call it Michigan Avenue, was scheduled to be reconstructed in 2018, and so the perception was that we had plenty of time to work on what we would like it to be and to get feed our input into uh, Michigan Department of Transportation, MDOT. And that got moved up just recently to be re being reconstructed in 2016, which means that we have probably six or nine months in order to decide what we in this community, and when I say we, I don't mean just city council, we, everybody in this community will provide input, have an opportunity to provide input, what that uh, road should look like when it's rebuilt, because it is going to get rebuilt. And we have an opportunity now to perhaps influence how it is reconstructed. And I don't know if it should be a road diet reconstruction, if it should be what it is exactly now, if it should be something in between with some islands for crossing, better defined crosswalks, better signalization. But whatever happens to Michigan Avenue in 2016 
is going to influence our community for the next 30 years because it'll be that long before they decide to want to do something with it again. Um, as, as Sal pointed out, it takes a lot of money to get things done and we don't want to spend it inappropriately. And so we have this opportunity now to uh, talk with MDOT and to find out from them what our options are and then we can begin to explore those options and see if there's things that we would like that MDOT doesn't present to us until we negotiate to have something. Um, I suspect that MDOT will do their design and go out for bid probably by fall or winter of next year in order to start construction in 2016. So we have a very short window to influence it. Uh, but I think it's important that we do influence it. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thanks, Janet. I agree with Mr. Rhodes, and I do not have a definitive position on a road diet, but I will say that I am 100% in favor of having a comprehensive road study done. I think that we need to gather as much information as we can so that we're able to make the best decision that we can. Because like Mr. Rhodes said, this is a once in a lifetime thing. Well, depending on your age, it might be twice. but. We really need to make the best choice, and we need to look forward. And we are talking about the traffic on the road right now. Well, what happens in the future? Will there be more bus transportation, like Mr. Rhodes is saying, so there will be fewer cars? Will there be automated cars to reduce the traffic? Will there be more pedestrians? We don't know these, and we need to analyze data and make the best informed decision that we can. All right. Thank you, Janet. Thanks, Janet. Before we move on to the final question from the moderators, I want to put out a final call for the um, audience questions. Please fill out a card if you would like to submit your question. Uh, we're going to do uh, start with Sal for question number five. Um, having covered government for a number of years, I've learned that oftentimes uh, people uh, get into elected office due to one specific thing or one specific pet project. It's not always the case, but it does happen often. Uh, please identify for the final question. Please identify one area of government that you want to improve if elected. Something, it, it could be anything from ordinance enforcement um, to lowering taxes to citizen engagement. Please identify one area that is that you feel could be a pet project for you to improve for citizens. Well, I would go back to my uh, original principles of trying to identify what the purpose of government is. I mean, we don't have to look very far to find out what the purpose of government is. Um, the preamble of the state of Michigan Constitution, it says, we the people of the state of Michigan, grateful to almighty God for the blessings of freedom and, the earnestly, de and earnestly desiring to secure these blessings undiminished to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain, establish this Constitution. What's the purpose of a government? The purpose of a government is to guarantee our freedoms, the freedoms of the people. The next line in Article 1 is, all political power is inherent in the people. Government is instituted for their equal benefit, security, and protection. Equal benefit security and protection. That's the purpose of the government. Not all these pet projects. It's not for uh, you to elect somebody to come up here who has an idea to see if their idea is better than another idea. Your freedom and, and the freedom and the equal protection of everyone here is the paramount thing. What's happened with government? Government has, has taken freedom away from the people by taking more and more of their rights away. They have to ask for permission to do anything. And they've made their, their selves more free to do more of what they want. So my thing would be give the freedom back to the people. That's where it comes from. You only have the power in government to do what the people have the power to do themselves. They grant you a portion of that freedom. And, and so you can't do things that they can't do. I can't go to my neighborhood neighbor and say, hey, I need transportation to get to the store, so give me some money, and hold a gun to their head. That's wrong. It's not up to government, to, and, and, and we don't want to put government in our place to do the same thing. Listen, more of 
what needs to be done needs to be taken by the back by the people. Our churches, our civic groups, volunteers, many in our community are getting older. They can help other people get to where they need to go. There are services for transportation, Uber, Lyft, Zipcar. There's people, there's, there's uh, uh, churches. Everybody can work together to provide these services. We don't need to keep looking to government to solve every problem. The people are able to serve the, solve those problems. Hey, government, keep yeah. us safe and give us our freedom. Thank you. Thanks. David. My time's up. <laughs> yeah. It was more gentle than a hook. So. <laughs> um, I, I did just want to mention that um, I'd be really disappointed if our elected officials did not have ideas of their own to bring forth. I don't know how we would uh, maintain our quality of life and or do any improvements if we didn't have ideas. But just because we have ideas doesn't mean it's going to happen, but we can put those forward. Um, the one area of governance that um, I have made some um, strides forward in is in including increasing the involvement of our citizens within the city government. Um, one of the steps that, that we have taken lately, and I would take credit for initiating that, is we've, we've started the See, Click, Fix app on smartphones so that people, when they see a problem, can report it. It can get assigned to the right department to take care of, and they get a response back about what has been done with that particular issue. Um, I, I would like to see more people come to our city council meetings. I'm, I'm always kind of disappointed at the relatively low turnout that we get, unless there's a specific issue that some folks are, are worried about. Um, we have recently put our council meetings out on the, uh, on the web and on a uh, live slight delay um, on our television, Channel 18, thanks to uh, Chase, wherever he went. There he is, <laughs> armories in the back. <laughs> um, and, and we have two publications in town that do an excellent job of reporting what's going on and what happens within our community, but we need feedback from the residents. You know, we, we go out as elected officials and we talk with people, but we tend not by on purpose, but I think we tend to end up talking with a lot of the same people because that's who we come into contact with and those are folks who are comfortable talking to us. And I'd like to come up with a way to, to have more citizens provide input on specific issues that are coming up to council. Some of the things that come to council, I would prefer that they come to us first in kind of an informational purpose a package and then the, perhaps the next council meeting that we vote on them so that we have more time to actually uh, obtain input from citizens. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. I don't have a specific agenda. I don't have a gripe. That's not why I'm here. I'm here to do the best job I can for the city of Saline. And one thing that I think needs to happen is that we need to get residents more engaged in our city. We can't just make decisions based on what we think people want. And we are moving forward with that. Um, there's a lot of avenues now. There aren't that many people that come to city council meetings, but there are social media, there are apps, there are a lot of things to get people engaged. And we need to get those out to people so that we can get the feedback and make the choices and decisions that will affect those people. Um, fortunately for us, we're a local government. We're not the Congress. We're not Lansing. We have a ability, I think, to work together and work as a better functioning unit than most of the other government that decides to think that the lobbyists pay their bills and not the citizens of the country. Um, in my case, what I've always been is attempted to try and be, have consistency and accountability. Um, my approach was always to make sure that whatever decision or whatever we're looking at doesn't necessarily exclude someone just because it makes the benefit to a developer or a de benefit to another individual. It's consistency. I think the things that I would like to look to do in the next couple of years is really looking at what a concern has been, sidewalk replacement, addressing that and how we're going to fund it. And it needs to be a shared aspect. I want to see it be not necessarily paid by all the taxpayers, but 
how we've always approached it in the past and looking at who's responsible for what piece of it and go handling that. I also think we need to look at how we're going to fund our roads. We know we have roads coming up, and if we have another severe winter like we had this year, we're going to have to do more repairs. So my, always, my approach has been to look at accountability, to look at how we can finance things, to try and assess what can we do differently to improve our services. We've looked at our staff. We've looked at our salaries. I brought in ideas. I like to look at the trends that are occurring because I, look at a, I work at another larger organization. Um, I look at the other things that I think are important for us is our historic approach, our assets that we currently have, things that really make us the unique city that we are, and working towards what individuals have voted for have accepted to do that, and as a result of being a representative of the city, individuals vote for us for our opinions and our ideas, and they expect us to do the majority of it. When there's an issue, we hear about it. People will come forth, and I agree, we need more input by the citizens, and we're trying that. I Hopefully that some of the tools that we're using online, but we still have to figure a way to make sure that those individuals that are not using all of the electronic devices are participating, and a lot of that is trying to get them to submit either letters or watching on television or even watching wherever they can see us. I think those have been some of the better benefits for it. And perhaps maybe we need to televise more of our commission meetings and those type of things so people get a little more idea of what's actually going on. Um, for me, I think the idea is really the approach that government can be effective, it can be efficient, it can be something that helps the community, and there are those expectations of specific essential services, but there's also those items that are a little bit more and that we have to look at, and I think we can accomplish if we look at other things that we may have to forego. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. All right, that concludes the panelists' questions, and now we move on to audience questions. Um, while we're asking a few questions here, feel free to grab a card, um, write a question, and, and give it to us. We might filter it for, uh, you know, to make sure it's appropriate and everything. Um, but we'll try to get the meat of the question in there. And um, before you go, uh, when you leave here tonight, uh, you might want to consider going downtown for uh, Ladies' Night Out, Celine Main Street's putting that on. I thought I'd get that plug out there, if that's okay, Chase. Hope we didn't break any cable rules. Anyway, so here's here's the question um, from the audience, and we're going to start. And, and now the questions are 90 seconds, uh, 90 second answers um, here. So we're going to start with David Rhodes this time. Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right, David Rhodes. How do you envision working with your council colleagues, and what's your working style? Um, you the question? Yes. I have to speak up. Yes. Okay. How do you envision working with your council colleagues, city council colleagues? And what's your working style? I, I believe that I'm a consensus builder. I, I listen to other people. I uh, take their ideas. I talk about things with others. I, I read a lot of materials. I subscribe to a lot of different publications. I get boatload of emails from various folks. And, and so um, I, I very seldom take a hard position. Um, I'm generally slightly malleable, I guess. There are times, though, when, um, when one does need to, to take a firm position, and so I will do that from time to time, but that's not typically my style. All right. Okay. Thanks, David. Janet? I believe that every action is going to have a reaction, and you've got to look at both sides and weigh out the benefits on both sides. Is there going to be a high cost? And will it, in the end, work out? And that's where I, I believe that due diligence is very important. You need to study things, not make quick decisions, and be completely informed before you make that decision. So afterwards, you're not saying, oops, we didn't realize this was going to be the outcome. Thanks, Janet. Dean. For me, I think it's been, I like to consider myself a facilitator. I like to make sure that all the voices are being participating in the event. Um, like Mr. Rhodes, I like to believe that um, I can be malleable at times, but I do take a hard line on certain issues that I feel are strongly important to the success and the growth of this city. I think there's items that I don't want to maneuver on because I feel that some of the rules and the regulations that are in place are there for a reason, and they're there to help us govern, but also to help make sure that other people are being represented and heard from. Um, in terms of the council, I think right now we have a good group. We work together because for the majority of 80 to 95% of the issues, 
We all have negotiated, we've talked about it, we know what's going on. It's not like we're all coming to the table without any information. Where we get to our discussions, there's more of the issues that really need to have people involved in them. And that's where we have to try and rely upon more discussion points and bring other individuals in. And if we have different opinions, we're going to voice them. That's how a group works, that's compromise. That's how we approach to get decisions made. I think it, the best approach for us to do is to be ourselves, to work with one another, and if we do have disagreements, we're going to have disagreements. We just need to figure out how to work through them and try and approach a better approach to get the answers we need. Thanks, Dean. Sal. Well, um, first of all, I would I, I'm, I would listen. Uh, we're talking about how would we would work together, and I would listen. I would listen to everybody's point of view. What I find with the council right now is they tend to vote all together. It seems like they're all in the same club, and I can't understand why there's not a dissenting point of view. I mean, I have a wife and myself and five children. There's seven of us, and we can't agree on anything. So how does this council just agree on mostly everything all the time? It seems like there's a bias. And for one reason or another, the voters have elected one type of individual to be on the Saline City Council. You know, if you, if you uh, want politicians to favor millionaires, vote for more millionaires. If you want politicians to favor government bureaucrats, vote for more people in the government. I'm not from the government, I'm from the street. I'm, I'm an ordinary citizen, and I'm looking out for ordinary citizens. So I would listen, but I wouldn't compromise my principles. Now, what is a compromise? Somebody eats too much, that's not good. Somebody eats too little, that's bad too. Eating somewhere in the middle, that's a good compromise. But the compromise of, well, should we charge 38% uh, tax or 37% uh, tax? That's not, that's not the type of compromise that I, I want to be a part of. Thanks, Thank so. you. Thanks, so. For this question, we're going to start with Janet. Will our taxes be raised next year? Let me back up. If our taxes are raised next year, will it be by bonding or requesting uh, more millage by city charter? I don't have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> is that a Mary question? Mary, is that okay? Yes. How I worded it, is it? Well, yes, that was basically it. There was a work meeting talking about if the uh, taxes were increased, there were two ways of which it would be done. And that was basically uh, asking, because the vote of the people, I, I know a little bit of the answer, so I'm sorry. It's okay, don't be sorry. Yeah, I think it's okay if you don't have an answer. Yes. Yeah. Um, having been part of that discussion and what it was, was they were giving examples of how you can raise millage. We don't know at this point. We don't have any idea what we're going, but I don't see why we would have a tax increase next year when we already did a slight one. And in fact, we're hoping to hold the line. The only concern is, is if we decide to do roads, do we have sufficient funds in order to do it? And if we don't, my thing would be we would take it to the vote of the people like we've done many times in the past and they make the decision of whether or not they want to contribute more money towards the, ta to the roads or if they want to slow down or wait for the state to come up with an idea or what they want to do. But my idea is that's what we can. We can't afford to do roads and continue to have our operations when we don't have sufficient funds to do it. It's not getting cheaper to do roads. It's getting more expensive. The state knows that too. But they're not providing money like they used to in the past and they haven't any decision on how to fix it. So from Mary's perspective, where she'd asked the question about um, raising millage, I think we're already fine on our millage. We don't need to raise that any further. We do need to consider how do we pay for our roads, which are million-dollar expenses. And if, if we have to do it within our current revenue sources, we're going to have to cut services even farther. Can so. I address that question? Yes. Uh, l let me, from my exp uh, perspective, explain how government works. I, I, I was on the Parks Commission here in Saline, and they have a wish list of needs, and one of them, I think, was a pavilion in a park. And I said, that, yeah, that's great. 
why don't we look for a benefactor, somebody that would want to put their name on it and be willing to donate the money? There's many wealthy people in this community. There's many people that love this community. There's many people that would give money from their own pockets if they knew that something was needed. But you know that idea didn't get much thought. And I'll tell you why, because it's so much easier just to tax people. It's a lot easier to tax people than it is to go out and try to ask for the money. Why do you ask when you can just take it? So if we want to be a com community, a real community, we need to look within ourselves. We need to find those individuals. Look, at there's a dozen churches in Saline. None of them function by taxes. They all function by voluntary contribution. How do they stay? How do they keep the lights on? People donate their money. You don't have to take. Love your neighbor doesn't mean you vote to tax your neighbor. Thank you, sir. David? Yeah, I, I do not anticipate any tax increase next year. Um, I, I think we're, we're okay where we are. We do have some more development coming into town that will increase our tax base. And if it turns out that we do need to bond for road improvements, I suspect that the repayment of those bonds will need to come out of our existing tax revenues. Thank you. Thanks, David. All right, we have another question from the audience here. Uh, we start with Dean this time. The question is, the state government has cut businesses ta business taxes a lot. Is it really necessary to give tax abatements locally? Um, at this approach, tax abatements are kind of been eliminated as a result of the way that the new property taxes are going to be assessed and applied. So in our case, abatements would be pretty much gone. There isn't really, any, except for real estate, real property from which we will be able to continue to abate. But what we used to give was a 50% abatement on personal property, and now that's been eliminated. The issue would be if we want to really bring in a specific employer or something that potentially could put a significant investment into our um, tax base, yes, I think we probably would still continue to do that. 50% of something is better than 50% of nothing, and the idea is that business is going to not only provide for employment, hopefully for individuals living in Saline, but also to contribute towards the reduction towards taxes that we would not have to continue to place upon the residents, but put it more so on our business and commercial approach. We've been wanting this to be the approach. We want to see more business come into our industrial parks. We want to have that additional diversity in our tax base so that if potentially, and God forbid, Forsia decides to close its doors, which could have happened five or six years ago, we need to be able to prepare ourselves and have those businesses in the background, otherwise we're going to be extremely in trouble. So whatever we can do to continue to continue to have businesses come in here that are successful, that want to be here, we need to kind of continue to look at that, but case by case. We can't just necessarily give it to anyone. Um, but we need to make sure what we're doing is appropriate to continue and support our tax base. All right. Thanks, Dean. Sal? Yeah, I'll address that. I mean, did you hear what I read earlier from the state of Michigan Constitution? It says government is instituted for their equal benefit. Now, where is the fairness of granting a business special tax breaks when you've got another business that's stuck with this community for 30 years or more? Where's their benefit? I don't see it. I say give everybody the same taxes, lower the taxes. You'll attract people. You'll attract businesses. You'll attract uh, investors. How many times have we seen these gifts from government backfire? Dozens of times. It happens all the time. So everybody should be treated equally. Do we want to pick and choose which businesses we want? We're going to take uh, the taxpayer, the people, the people living in their homes, they're going to uh, uh, support a certain business, whoever these gentlemen decide. That's not fair. That's not equity. That's not equal. Lower the taxes on everybody. There should be no special interests. All businesses should be treated equally. Thanks, Al. David? Yeah, I've never been a fan of, of tax abatements, but I don't know how to eliminate them when everybody else is offering tax abatements around us. I did initiate uh, an effort uh, a couple years ago to recalculate the formula that is used to decide how much tax abatement a company would get and for how long. Um, the old formula had a, a section in it that said for every $50,000 worth of investment, that equals one job. And so people could get credit for jobs that they 
not necessarily going to bring, particularly with this newer economy where equipment costs more, but it's purchased and put in by companies because it requires fewer staff to operate it. So that, that moved us in the right direction, I think, and it did not cause us to lose anybody because of that change in our tax abatement formula. So, but it, if there is a way to eliminate it and still have a successful business recruitment program, I'd be really happy to look at that. Thank you. Thanks, David. Janet. I generally agree with Sal's philosophy, but in theory only, it just won't work. Celine is underdeveloped. We need to bring in businesses, and we need to give them some sort of incentive to come here. At some point, maybe we can look at not having abatements, but at this point, we need to bring those businesses in. We need that revenue. We need it could bring in the revenue to help our tax burdens. It will also bring in additional employment opportunities. And it's something that Celine needs at this point. Thanks, Janet. Let me go to the next question. You want me to do this one or do you want to go? take that? Okay. I think we're starting with Sal this time. We had plenty of empty shopping center spaces when a new shopping center was built. Mm -hmm. How can we convince merchants to use space that's already available? <laughs> empty shopping centers are gloomy places. Well, that's true. Empty shopping centers are gloomy places, but we live in a free market society. We are a free people. Investors that have money are free to purchase property, and they're free to build. And in a free market uh, system, you're going to have successes, and you're going to have failures, and that's what makes us better. We learn from the failures. Now, empty Empty shopping centers, they find tenants when their rents go down and their taxes go down. They give opportunities for people with not a lot of money to invest, but the desire to be entrepreneurs. And what I've seen from this city council is a, is a total skew towards big business. They want to deal with big developers. They want big projects. Uh, so. Uh, you know, they don't really give the little guy a chance. You know, years ago when immigrants came to this country, they bought little parcels, they built little buildings, and they buildings got stacked next to each other, and the little guy had an opportunity. Uh, governments don't want to deal with that. It's too complicated. They'd rather deal with one big guy that builds one big development. So they keep making the rich richer, and they don't give the little guy the opportunity. So you know what, there's going to be an empty shopping center uh, if, if, when that happens. We have to understand that it's not government's role to tell people where and how to invest their money. It's their money. Think about it. Do you want government telling you how to spend your money? So, My time. So. Thank you. David? You know, it is true that we are going to have uh, new development come in uh, when there are existing spaces available. That's kind of the nature of things, has always been that way, and I suspect always will be. It does provide, as, as uh, Sal mentioned, an opportunity when the uh, rents are reduced on those less popular shopping centers for new, smaller businesses to get started. We're, we're seeing that now in what was the ACO shopping center, where there is a microbrewery that's come in, and uh, because the rents have gone down, they've been able to open up, prepare to open up a microbrewery there in the old Jasmine space. That's a new business that could not have afforded to go into one of the new shopping centers because those costs are higher. Um, there's, a, there's a new funding mechanism within the state of Michigan. It's called MILE. Uh, Michigan Initiative for uh, Entrepreneurs, and it's, it's crowdfunding. Most of you, or many of you, are familiar with things like Kickstarter. This is an opportunity for individuals to invest, not to donate, but to invest in new startup companies. And we're going to have a, a presentation from Michigan Municipal League on November the 11th, 7 o'clock in the evening at Mangiamos, to talk about crowdfunding. So if you're thinking of starting a business or you know someone who wants to start one, have them come to that. Thank you. Thanks, David. Janet. I think we need to look at why the spaces are vacant. 
are these are we bringing in the wrong businesses are they not serving the needs of our community maybe that's where we need to focus on is is serving what we need providing the the retail the restaurants so that Celine becomes more self-sufficient and people stay in Celine and not go outside of the community to spend their dollars all right thank you Dean um, I agree with um, Mr. Randazzo, the issue about the centers need to adjust their rents. That's the issue. It's a free market. They want to set their rates. Well, if they have them high, they're not going to get um, they're not going to get individuals wanting to rent them. Part of the other problem that we really have to understand and try and figure out is big block stores, um, brick and mortar is not the way the business is moving. Um, online shopping, potentially what's going to become 3D printing, and all those type of things are going to impact things more and more. We're going to have to look at reusing those type of facilities for other things, including services or other approaches. And at some point, some of those buildings potentially will have to come down because there won't be the individuals to support those. We can only hope that our growth continues. But I think the other thing that we have to look at is not only our economic development um, initiatives that we have in the city, but we need to keep pressure somewhat on some of our individuals that are owning these type of properties to make sure that what we can as a city to assist with them and to actually connect them with people like the Chamber of Commerce or anything else that potentially could help with those owners and perhaps be able to give them an idea of looking towards new individuals that might want to rent their properties. Um, the biggest issue, though, is we have to face the reality, and as I myself know, um, to be popular in order to get rent, you're going to have to be in a location that really is the, the key thing, and now hopefully because of urbanism and new urbanism, those type of things are pushing back in towards the center of a core. So it's a change in trends. Things will spread out, things will come into the center. It's over a period of time, we just have to address it. Thanks, Dean. All right, thanks. All right, so I think this is, this is the final question. Yeah. I believe this is the final question and it's a two-part question on enforcement of ordinances. Um, the basic question here is, how uh, how do we enforce the ordinances specifically? Street parking with uh, non-running cars, um, and also event signs on the four corners that sometimes blow over and uh, get in people's way when they're walking on the sidewalks. And that's our final question of the night. And we start. And you didn't hear it. Oh, sorry. You stand up, maybe. Oh, okay, I can stand up. I'm not sure how much louder that will make me, but. Okay. Uh, this question is about ordinances and this and how should the city enforce its ordinances specifically with street parking of uh, non-running vehicles, non-operable vehicles and also about um, event signs at the four corners that blow over and block the walkway. I think the basic question in here is there's ordinances on the books that aren't being enforced. What should the city do to or should the city be looking at and enforcing them, enforcing them more? And how would you do that? I think we're starting with David. And we start with David. Okay, thank you. Uh, with respect to uh, code enforcement, the city did in fact have a full-time code enforcement officer at one point. That position was eliminated while we were trying to adjust to the decreased revenues. We now have a part-time individual uh, who is doing that code enforcement as best he can considering the area that he has to cover and the wide variety of potential difficulties. So it, because of reduced staffing, we react primarily now to complaints. So if a resident sees an issue that they believe is in violation of a city ordinance, that's one example where you can use the C-click fix thing on a smartphone, or you can just call City Hall, or you can send an email or drop a note in and um, the code enforcement officer will attempt to resolve the situation. It might not happen as soon as what you think it should, but um, he does a good job, I believe, with the, with the resources he has available. Thank you. Thank you. Janet. Earlier I made mention about losing services, and as Mr. Rhodes said, I think the enforcement officer was a great loss to the city. I think the city does need a full-time one. It shouldn't be the police's responsibility to be fielding calls about parked cars or sidewalks. That's not what they're there for. 
And I think we need to look at what our ordinances are and see, are they valid? And if they are and they're on the books, then we need to enforce them. There's no point in having rules that are not enforced. It's just going to just, it's a slippery slope. Thank you, Janet. Dean? Um, I agree with Mr. Rhodes on the idea of using our tools that we have available. C Clicks Fix has been one of the best ones that we have in currently where you can actually take a picture of the item, send it on, and you can track what's happening with it. You'll get a notification whether or not it's been addressed. You'll get a notification it's actually been taken care of. Um, the other thing is when we look at ordinance enforcement, um, my concern is that we have to find another way of looking at who else can potentially help assist with some important in terms of abandoned cars on the street that is a ucc issue that is a police officer they need to deal with it um, if it's a license unlicensed vehicle or whatever that's part of the thing it's a shared approach many small communities utilize their staff in other ways to help assist with this especially their police force and there's nothing that says we can't try and look at that as another approach to do it the issue is where do we need to really consider enforcement and where do we really need to have a concern as to where we don't need to and I think our ordinance reinforcement our task force that we currently have reviewing ordinances and the city charter will help address some of that issue um, as I've always said and it's been my issue ordinance enforcement has been on the top of my list and I think it's one of the things where if we don't address the issues such as junk or other aspects that are really bringing down the quality of life to an individual in their neighborhood or an aspect to which they feel could affect their property values, we're not doing our job and we need to address those as soon as we can. Thanks, Dean. Sal. I'm going to say something that's probably just very kind of maybe different or shocking. Uh, I mean, we talk about building a community and, and if you see something that is uh, just disturbing to you in some way, before involving government, with government is force, and, and usually it's like a sledgehammer rather than like a feather duster. Why not knock on the door and say, hey, you know, uh, that, that thing there is, is a nuisance, it's bothering me, it's uh, decreasing the value of my property, could you move it, could you take care of that? H how do we engage each other if we're always going to hide behind government and code enforcement officers? Uh, I've run for city council. I shouldn't say run. I'm seeking kid, uh, uh, city council. Running's too hard. Um, but twice. And every time I get my name on the ballot, I got a code enforcer knocking on my door for some reason. So I'm wondering, is code enforcement selective? We go after some people, not other people. I'm against a police state. If we're a community and we act with love, Get to know your neighbors. Bring them a pie if they got a car parked there. Walk over with a pie and say, hey, uh, you know what, do you mind moving that? Uh, it it kind of uh, bothered me and I got family coming by and I don't like looking at it. Let's try to f solve problems ourselves. And then, if that doesn't work, then you have a police department. A police department that could come out and issue tickets. You don't need a code enforcement officer because that person is just gonna be going around looking for everything. Thanks, Thank so. Okay, now we have closing statements. Uh, 90 seconds, and I believe we start with Janet. Okay, mine's gonna be very short and sweet. It's <laughs> all right. <laughs> I promise to be effective and a valuable member of the city council. That was true. That was <laughs> short and sweet, yeah. <laughs> all right. Maybe it's short. Um, I just want to continue my service that I've been doing. I think I've been doing an appropriate job. I try to keep what I believe is what I've seen as tradition. I want to keep the accountability going. I want to keep the facilitating the growth and as aspects that we can be looking at is to continue as a successful community and to continue to bring about the best of the life that we currently have and to keep our quality of life as best as we can. Thank you. Thanks, Dean. So. Politics is about power. Most people run for government office because they, they want power and when they get some power, they want to tell other people how to live. Um, I'm seeking office very reluctantly. Uh, I, you know, uh, Edmund Burke said, uh, uh, evil prevails when good men do nothing. And I've been sitting back for 28 years and I've watched how the corruption has uh, increased in the city. And I'm just, I'm just an average Joe. I'm just a guy that lives on Hickory Lane and, and likes motorcycles and, 
and uh, raised five kids here, and I want to be on council so I can be a counterweight to those that want to bring their ideas and take your money and try to uh, uh, invest it in ways that they couldn't on their own because they don't have the money to do it themselves. That's wrong. Uh, there's essential services that we need in government. Safety, cleanliness, pick up the trash, give us clean water. That's all any of us want. All this other stuff is spending your money. I mean, they just spent $15,000 of your money the other day to do a study on this Michigan Avenue US-12 thing. You would think between a city manager, a city engineer, a DPW director, and all the brain trust in the city, they could have saved you $15,000. They, they know the qualifications of what, what works with a uh, with a, a road diet, they know what it is. No, but they want to cover their behinds by putting it on a, a consultant and spending your money. So, my time's over. <laughs> Thanks, Sal. <laughs> yeah, and um, I, I'm seeking a, a fifth consecutive term on city council. Um, I'm 73 years old. I've got a lot of life experience, but I'm still kind of young at heart. I, I get involved with things. Um, uh, passionate about my community and I think the fact that I am involved in so many different things is beneficial because it, it enables me to be a connector so when I'm in one group and they have a question about something that's going on I may very well know what's going on in this other group and help them work together so I I, I believe I've helped a lot of organizations in, in a community um, in response to one of the last questions about ordinance enforcement Dean mentioned it, but I, among other things that I do, I serve on the code review task force, and we all are, are looking at all of the city codes and ordinances and eventually the city charter um, to see what could be changed, reduced, taken out, um, made more efficient for our citizens. And I, you know that's one of the things I want to continue on. I also want to continue trying to bring in more businesses and residents. Um, I, I love Celine. That's uh, that's my home. That's where I am. And that's where I'm going to stay. Thank you. Thanks, David. And I believe that concludes all of our questions. Thank you. Uh, we hope you've learned uh, a little bit tonight, and we'll make a more informed choice on November 4th. Um, we would like to thank the candidates for appearing and answering all of our questions, and we'd like to thank you for attending tonight. And uh, Stay tuned to SCTN, the Celine Reporter, and the Celine Post, and this video will be online, as well as uh, other election features. And the Celine Reporter is hosting uh, a mayoral forum with candidates Lee Burgoyne and Brian Morrow, October 17th at 7 p.m. right here. 6.30. At 6.30 p.m., sorry, right here at Liberty School. Uh, have a great night. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Thank you.